Children, you are dismissed to junior church. <clears throat> As they are headed to junior church, let us bow in prayer, shall we? <clears throat> oh, Heavenly Father, as we approach you this morning, we come to worship your holy name. We bow down in our hearts with joy, knowing that there is no other God but you, and that you are pure, and that you are full of mercy and grace toward us who are sinners. We come confessing that, Heavenly Father, we revel in our sin. We are more prone to obey the dictates of our own flesh rather than walking in the Spirit. We confess that we are more prone to exalt our own self and not exalt and worship you. But also, Lord, we confess that your Son, Jesus, is our Savior. That you, Heavenly Father, loved us beyond measure. And that you would give all that we might be forgiven and have life. And that you would bring us to your bosom and make us your children and empower us to live a godly and holy life. For this we adore and worship you, O God. For this we sing praises unto you. For this we are encouraged in our own spirits to share this news with others. For you have changed our lives in a most fundamental way. And you have brought us out of bondage and slavery to our sin, to a freedom to walk in Christ and a freedom to know you like we could never know you. And for this we thank you and we praise you and we honor you. And so now, Heavenly Father, as we approach this subject of your holiness, how can someone so sinful speak of it with any credibility. But God, you have given us your word. You have given us your truth. And so with that, we seek to be encouraged this day by your truth. And help me, O oh God, as I stammer, to share what it is about you and your holiness this morning. And we ask this, O oh God, for your honor and glory through your Jesus, through through your Son, Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if you would, in your bulletin, there is an outline with for my sermon today. And follow along. Isaiah the prophet wrote these words. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted seated on a throne and the train of his robe filled the temple above him were seraphim each with six wings with two wings they covered their faces and with two they covered their feet and two they were flying and they were calling to one another holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty the whole earth the whole earth is filled with his glory. Now the beloved Apostle John was transported in a vision to the very throne room of God. And there he saw God, the God of glory, seated on a throne. He wrote, In the center around the throne were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and with back. The first living creature was, was like a lion, and the second was like an ox, and the third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. 
Each of the four living creatures had six wings, was covered with eyes all around, even under the wings. And day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. When the Bible describes the essential nature of God, the Bible doesn't say love, 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 or mercy, 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 or grace, 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 or even wrath, wrath, wrath. The Bible wants us to know more than anything else about the person of God is that He is holy, holy, holy. Now understanding the holiness of God is important, important to us because as the Apostle Peter writes, He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Now we're going to get back to that later in the message. So as we look at the holiness of God this morning, we shall study two aspects of God's holiness. And that's the holiness as to God's person and holiness as to God's actions. And then finally, holiness in God's people. Let's begin by looking at the holiness of God as it reveals First, or he relates to his person. Theologians have called this God's internal holiness, what he is in his essential being. Now there are a negative aspect to this, and there is also a positive aspect to understanding God's holiness as it relates to his essential being. Holiness, when you think of holiness, it primarily means apartness or otherness. To say that God is holy is to call attention to a profound difference between God and all creatures. He transcends all things created in majesty and in glory. He is altogether different and other from any created thing. And thus he commands all men everywhere to adore and honor and worship him. For God is altogether good and great. Now, holiness also carries the idea of separation. Not only is God other from all created beings, He is separate from them. This is especially true because man is sinful and evil as a result of the fall. God is entirely, God is entirely separate from and apart from sin and evil. Now, the idea of apartness and otherness and or separation is conveyed in the Bible when it speaks of things being holy. When the Bible speaks of the holy objects or holy times or holy places or holy people, it refers to things that have been set apart or consecrated by the very touch of God upon them. For example, in Exodus chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, a story that all of you know well. It's the story of Moses and the burning bush. When the Lord saw that he, Moses, had gone over to look, God called to him from within the burning bush. Moses, Moses. He repeats Moses' name twice because it's an it's a expression of intimacy. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. And take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is what? Holy ground. Yes, holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face. Because he was afraid to look at God. 
In the burning bush there, the holiness of God was being displayed in all of its splendor. And Moses had to hide his face. He was afraid to peer into what holiness looked like, otherness looked like. The ground around the bush where Moses was standing was set apart. It was consecrated to God. It was holy ground because God, because God was there in a special way. Now there is also a positive aspect to the holiness of God. He is absolutely pure. There is no yeast or leaven as the King James Version would say in God. Nothing corrupt or foreign in him to make him impure. Nothing. Now, I use the term leaven or yeast because it was used by the Israelites in baking bread. And it's used by many of you ladies when you break bread. It was a foreign substance put into the flour to make it rise. And thus, it became a symbol for sin or anything impure. So you see, God has nothing impure in him. There is nothing leavened about God at all. And so when God instituted the first Passover, just before he brought the Israelites out of Egypt, what did he tell them not to do? He told them not to put yeast or leaven in the bread that they were to eat at the first Passover when the angel of death would pass over their homes. The bread was to be pure, unleavened, because they were being delivered from their old way of idolatry, their old way of life and bondage. And they were being not simply set free to their own devices. They were being set free to be set apart unto a holy God who is altogether pure. To say that God is pure is to say that he has no proclivity towards sin in any fashion. In fact, he has an unalloyed hatred of sin. The purity of God makes it so that he could never look upon sin with any delight. The prophet Habakkuk wrote, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Now what I've been referring to has been God's eternal righteousness. You see by nature God is holy, pure, set apart from all other created things. And from the, very, from the very beginning of creation, this one perfection, this single most attribute of God was what God wanted His people to know. If there is anything that God wants you to know about himself, is that he is holy. Now this is not to say that the other perfections of God are not important. They are very important. But his holiness is foundational to us in knowing who God is. If you miss that, you've missed it all. Martin, Joy, Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, the great business of the Old Testament is to reveal the holiness of God. And I believe this to be a masterful insight into the history of the Old Testament. If you read the Old Testament, and you remember the stories and the events of the Old Testament, such as the Exodus and the tabernacle, the temple, the words spoken by the prophets, even the captivities of the Jewish people going into exile, at the very core of these things, they all testify that the Israelites were to be a people holy unto the Lord, set apart from all the nations to be different because their God is holy. If there was one attribute that God wanted his people to know, the Israelites, was that their God is holy. Listen to these passages of Scripture for a moment. Exodus chapter 15, 13. <clears throat> In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. Exodus 22, 31. <clears throat> you are to be my holy people. 
Do not eat the meat of an animal torn by wild beasts. Throw it to the dogs. In other words, they were not to live like the pagans. They were separate unto God. And they were even to eat differently because they belonged to a holy God. Leviticus 10.3 <clears throat> Moses then said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke when he said, Among those who approach me I will be proved what holy in sight of all the people I will be honored <clears throat> Deuteronomy 14 2 for you are a people holy to the Lord your God out of all the peoples on the face of the earth the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession did you get the connection holy people treasured possession holy people treasured possession of God that's what you are that's what you are today holy people treasured possession if you are in Christ Isaiah 12 6 shout aloud sing for joy people of Zion for great is the Holy One of Israel among you Ezekiel 39 7 I will make known my holy name among my people Israel I will no longer let my holy name be profaned and the nations will know that I the Lord am the Holy One of Israel Psalm 71 22 I praise you with a harp for your faithfulness my God David wrote I will sing praise to you with the lyre Holy One of Israel Psalms 99 verses 1 through 3 the Lord reigns let the nations tremble he sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. God is holy in his nature. But not only is God pure and holy in his nature. He is, his actions are holy as well. And they are known as his righteous acts. You see, God always does what is right. He always acts in a righteous manner because his nature is holy. He can do no other. He can do no other. This is what is known as his external holiness. It is displayed in his dealings with men. And let me give you some examples of this <clears throat> before my throat and my voice die. I don't know why it's just that way today listen carefully to these examples when the Lord brought the ten plagues upon Egypt you remember that he didn't act capriciously he acted in righteousness even in the death of the firstborn he acted in righteousness for he warned them he warned them that he was the most holy God but they would not listen Refusing to allow Moses and Aaron to enter the promised land was God's righteous discipline on two of the greatest leaders that Israel ever had. The meekest man, Moses, and the first high priest. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, <clears throat> because you did not trust me enough to honor me. In other words, God had spoken to Moses and said, speak to the rock so it will give water to the Israelites rather Moses got angry and struck the rock in disobedience and because of that he did not honor the Lord as holy and the Lord said you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites you will not bring this community into the land that I give them as the Israelites went into the promised land Moses and Aaron died died because of their disobedience to God the destruction of Jericho and Ai was God's holiness in full display the cleansing of the promised land of the pagan Canaanites and the other surrounding nations was God's holy anger against centuries of unbridled wickedness and it would be shameful for me to speak of them to you and embarrassing for you to even hear them when the Lord caused the ground to open up and swallow Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and all their families for their rebellion against Moses, it was righteous judgment. 
The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was the outpouring of God's righteous anger on a perverse and wicked culture. The death, even in the New Testament, the death of Ananias and Sapphira in the Euler Church was an act of righteous discipline. Even, even the deaths of those who desecrated the Lord's Supper in the church of Corinth was the result of a holy God exercising discipline in His church. But you know we err if we think that all God does is go around and looking for sinful people to destroy. He doesn't. That is far from the truth. God does not delight in the death of the wicked. Not at all. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 and following, a passage of Scripture you need to read. God says that we are not as His children to despise the discipline and the, and the chast chastening of the Lord. And the reason he gives is that, is that we may what? Share in his holiness. That's why God disciplines us. That's why God has disciplined me in my life. So that I might ultimately share in God's holy character. You see, God's mercies are new every morning. He is compassionate and slow to anger. He desires all men to be saved. God's holy actions have a most wonderful and a powerful aspect to them. And we'll look at that in a moment. You see, it is because God is holy and His love, and because God is not only holy, He also loves, we are not consumed by His wrath. It is because God has such a holy hatred for sin and a, and a holy love for sinners, He planned from eternity to give His only Son as the sacrifice, the only sacrifice that could satisfy His holy justice. And He gave Jesus so He could save sinners, rebellious people like you and me. God does not take pleasure in punishing the wicked. He does not take pleasure in sending people to hell at all. He would rather they repent, believe, and be forgiven of their sins. And thus He shows us grace through His Son, Jesus, and causes the Holy Spirit to work in our souls to bring us to life so that we will repent and believe and be saved. This is God's holiness in action. This is the ultimate action of God's holiness. Holiness is seen in Jesus, His Son. But that brings me to the last point. <clears throat> and that is holiness in God's people. You remember, as I said earlier in my message, Peter writes, He who called you is holy. So be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. As well, Paul writes, for He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy, blameless in His sight. Ephesians 1.4 You see, the purpose of God choosing us to salvation was not simply for us to, to simply escape judgment, but it is to be separated unto Him and reflect His holy character in our lives as we live out our Christian life here on this earth. These verses, to be honest with you, are very troubling to me. For there is a real and present tension in my soul of desiring to be holy, yet at the same time knowing that I am not holy, and that I fail so often, that I, that I have a proclivity and a desire to fulfill the desires of this flesh rather than walk in harmony with the Holy Spirit. My expectations are high. But the reality is disappointing in my life. Now maybe not in yours. Maybe you've got it all together. Maybe you just are right there. I'm not. That's why I have to read the Bible every day. Every day. Because I forgot what I read the day before. 
And there are times when I say, Lord, why can't I just under, just keep this in my mind? I, I mean, my wife and I watched Jeopardy. And, and, and I, I, I am, am uh, how do I say this? Amazed at how these people just know this stuff. And I can't even hardly remember John 3.16 anymore. I mean, it's amazing to me. That's why I think God keeps me in the Word. Because <laughs> I really need to be reminded every day of it that, that, that my life does not measure up to a holy God. Now, I believe we all sense truly yes. this. So what Peter is really calling us... So what is Peter really calling us to do when he says, Be holy, for God says, I am holy. Is he exhorting us to strive for a standard of inner character that is really unattainable? Is he speaking in hyperbole? By the time of his writing this letter, did Paul reach some kind of high spiritual plane he wished for all of us to achieve? Some spiritual nirvana that we finally reached it? Of all people, of all people, People knew, Paul, P Peter, P P P P <laughs> Peter knew what it was to fail in his devotion to his Lord and Savior. There was that constant reminder of his denial of Jesus in his trial. I'm sure Peter many times thought back to that moment where when he finally denied the Lord three times, he looked over and the eyes of the Savior and the eyes of Peter met. And Peter realized what he did and he went out and he wept. There was even a time when Paul had to rebuke Peter publicly because his actions literally betrayed the gospel. And Peter, Peter was an impetuous and quick-tempered man. You remember, it was he who drew the sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant in the garden when they came to arrest our Savior. Even with all of that, yet Peter rejoiced in what? He rejoiced in his forgiveness and restoration to fellowship and ministry. It was all behind him because he really understood what it meant to have his sins forgiven by a holy and righteous God. You see, there's an abiding reality that you and I understand that we are really holy in the Lord. We are. The righteousness of God has been imputed to us because of Christ's sinless life and atoning sacrifice. It has all been paid for, not in part, but in whole. There's not a sin that you have committed or will ever commit that has not already been paid for by the death and the shedding of blood of the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So when God sees us, what does He see? He doesn't see the frailty and the weakness. He sees the very righteousness of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We call this positional righteousness. We are holy in God's sight. This will forever be. And we should rejoice in this. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now what Peter is calling us to is a practical holiness in daily living. Peter is exhorting us to what? Listen, to come apart from the world and positively manifest the holy character of God in our lives. Yes. And what he means by that is, is in a practical way of being honest, being patient, doing the things that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Those kinds of things uh, uh, manifest and, the, and are examples of God's holy character working in and out through your life. And if you want to know what that really means, 
Get in the Word. Read the Gospels, the life of Christ. Read the letters of the New Testament over and over, and you will begin to understand what Peter says when he says, Be holy, for God is holy. As believers, we have already been set apart unto God. We belong to Him. We are His treasured possessions. You are holy people. You are His treasured possessions. We are saints. I am Saint David. Marianne, I'd like you to remember that <laughs> you know I have to tell you a funny story I got up this morning and I looked in my closet and I saw this shirt that I have on the thing about this shirt is that I wore this last Sunday now I looked at it I didn't see any spots on it and I'm thinking, you know what? I'll save a little money. I don't have to get this to the cleaners again. So I put it on. I get my pants on. I'm ready to go to church. And my wife looks at me and says, you're not wearing that shirt. What do you mean I'm not wearing You wore that last Sunday. I, said, I wore that what? I just I look at it. It looks fine to me. She says, you're an embarrassment to me. Said, you're a reflection of who I am with the shirt. Well, I got an earful. Now, I, Marianne doesn't mind. And I felt like saying, you know, you're talking to St. David. <laughs> I didn't think it was the right time to say that. <laughs> so I just got in my work truck, sat on my work seat, which is filled with dust and dirt and, and sawdust, and came to church this morning. And when I got here, I wiped my clothes off, and I'm fine. Even if you are a saint, your wives have the right to give it to you. <laughs> Just to let you know that. All right. But we are a treasured possession even to your wife. I want you to know that. Now, my wife loves me dearly, deeply, and she wants me to look my best. But as I get older, I keep telling her, honey, there's one thing about getting old. We all get ugly. So that's just, just the way it is. I might have clean shirts, clean pants, but you can't change the face. <laughs> just getting old. All right, that's enough of that nonsense. As such, we are to be different, aren't we? Not, yeah, I remember the King James Version when I was in Bible college. They used that word peculiar. You know, the peculiar. If you're, if you're familiar with the King James Version, you're, we are peculiar people. I'd look at that and I'd go, what? And then, I, then the NIV came out and, and then it said different and, and, and I thought, well, that's why I'm getting the NIV. I don't want to read about peculiar anymore. I want to read about different. But anyway, we are different. We are distinct. We are distinct and different from everything that is what common. You're not common anymore. You might think you're just a common Joe. You're not. You are treasured possession of God because you are holy in Christ. Now let me bring this to a conclusion this morning. The holiness of God is not just some theological concept that we are supposed to embrace. It is a reality that has a profound impact upon this world and a profound impact in the lives of God's people. There's a day coming, there's a day coming in which the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 6 and following, and he writes these great words. To a hurting church, to a hurting people. God is just, that is, God is holy in his actions, he's writing to them. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction 
and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people. And that's us. And to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you, Paul writes to them, because you believe our testimony to you. Amen? Amen. And yet, because of His holiness, the sin question for all believers has forever been settled in Jesus Christ. Rather than experiencing the wrath of God at His second coming, we will receive literally the outcome, the culmination of our salvation, the outcome of our faith. We will one day have it all. We shall finally... We shall finally be like Him perfectly, complete in our character and person. Now that, beloved, is something to rejoice in and to hope in. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us rise and close in prayer, shall we? Oh, Father. Oh.